Yes. Wonderful. So thank you very much for this introduction and uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it, was, it was really a, a perfect introduction when uh, Shana just mentioned that it is really, really hard when working with real world data to get this all together and that there are so many tricky parts. So this is why I'm really happy to be in this spot. So I'm going to talk to you today about real world data for smarter apps. And what I mean by that is, or why are we going to talk about this and what is this talk about? It's about the question, what do you have to do if you want to integrate real world data to influence a digital experience? Or what do you have to do if you want to create a digital representation of the real world? And how can you pull this off? So the reason why I'm talking to you about this is, um, because we here at Podfish, we created a technology which is called the koala, uh, which is called koala, like the koala bear, but in truth, it means context-aware location assessment. And with that, really put in short, it's a data engine. So not a graphic engine, but a data engine where we combine tons of different data sources. So starting from geolocation, so. OpenStreetMap, Google Data, that kind of stuff. Uh, we combine this with elevation data, with crime, surroundings, moon phases, weather, transportation, um, sightseeing stuff, um, and so on and so forth. So every real world data source which crosses our path, we are integrating that into the system so that we can deliver all these various data points to other developers in one unified API. And this in real time. So we're not delivering pictures of stuff. We're delivering the data so that everything you see and want to do, you can combine in real time. So this is, this is what you see here is a short render uh, from one of the areas inside but with Koala data attached. So bear with me. I'm going to talk, so this talk is divided in several parts. So the first part here, I'm going to give you a bit more perspective of what Koala does and what it is about and what customers of our service, because Koala is available as software as a service, what they're building with it and doing with it. After that, I'm going into a longer part with lessons learned while employing real world data for various apps. So there are so many do's and don'ts. There are so many learnings to make. What is a good way of approaching real world data in your app and what is a way where you really should be very careful and think about certain things. And the last part of this talk is a bit workshop-like because we're going to take a look uh, jump into Koala itself and do like two to three different contexts, which we're just going to do uh, live here with you guys, just, just to show you how easy it can be to work with big data. So one question we are, so you have to bear with Koala for five more slides. So one question we are regularly asked is what kind of data points do you have? And this is a super tricky question to answer because when you're talking about data, even if you, if you draw from OpenStreetMap data, so you have petabytes of data you can draw from. And we not only have draw from OpenStreetMaps, but from tons of different other sources. So when talking about Koala, what we did is we basically created a structure which allows us to implement new data sources super fast. And in a very, very simplified manner, we divide this into dynamic data. So data which is constantly changing, which is fluctuating, which might need to be updated every couple of seconds or minutes or hours, depending on the data source. Static data, like for example, streets and buildings, I mean, they will not run away within five minutes. So you have much long, longer update cycles to take care of. And we have a custom data layer. And the custom data layer can have 
your personal data points you wanted uh, you wanted to work with it can be inclusion of iot systems these can be very very different and diverse things so broadly speaking when it comes to static data we're working with land ocean data country segmentation geolocation data supplemented by by other data points where we find the data quality is poor Sightseeing, POI information, elevation data, population density, demographic stuff, uh, chain stores. I think we use the wrong word here because we are Germans. So uh, we mean something like uh, big brands, Burger Kings, McDonald's, Starbucks, these kind of, of stores, which might be very important for a certain kind of app and crime, which we are currently implementing. When it comes to dynamic, we can combine all these things with weather, with aviation data, transportation data, if it's important that you know that uh, that someone is standing at a bus stop and the bus is five minutes late or stuff like that. Uh, sightseeing information, how many people are at a certain site at this point of time, how many people checked in, checked out, etc. So what we're doing with this data, the first step is we're bringing it into the system to unify it, to clean it up. Uh, we cache stuff, uh, we refine it, we clean it up, we simplify it, we correlate it. So the big problem you have when working with different data sources is they come all in different formats. And the next thing is they come with different namings. So the nomenclature is different. Just a quick and easy example when you're working with geolocation data, one provider is talking about playgrounds. But in another provider, you would never ever find a playground under that tag because playgrounds are a combination of patches of sand with play things on it. This is something you need to know. But this is something, if you are not a data scientist, you will not know. If you're a software developer, you really don't want to know it. You don't want to go in this nitty gritty detail when creating a product. So this is stuff we already did. Um, also, we maintain it, we update, etc. And then we use all these data points uh, with a back end where with the help of visual scripting, our clients can create their own contexts. So I'm, I'm going to do a dumb one. So if your app need or if you want to know that your customer is on a playground, no, on a cemetery, during full moon, during a thunderstorm, I don't know why you want to know it, but if you want to know it, this is something you could click together in a backend and then just tell Koala, okay, please inform the client, my product, when this is the case. With all that, we can fill the data either on QIs, on longitude, latitudes, at certain points in the world, or we can fill the world on a grid base, so in different zoom levels. And this brings me here. Apart from delivering the data points, we also created a couple of uh, a couple of modules you can attach on top. So we are following a module structure because uh, up till here we only supply data. We don't collect. So we are very GDPR compliant. This is all very um, very impersonal. So, but there are some modules where we need to track certain data points. So we give developers the option to just choose the level of involvement they want to have. And with that, we can also, so what we also offer is we give you a layer where you can show other users of your product on the map. Um, we help with push notifications, which are context sensitive, but I'm coming to that later. Um, because it's very cool that you can create a context like hey, my user is on a cemetery at night during full moon, but maybe you, you even want to do something with that, like informing a gamer that at this point, a champion of the undead just spawned and you can collect it now. So, and we also support user-generated POIs. So if you need to know from your users or, or you want to de develop an app which, which allows users to I don't know, maybe you say, hey, my bike got stolen at this point, or hey, this is this is a location you were scouting for, and, and your users should mark that at a certain geolocation or a certain context. We allow for that with this extra module. 
the data we're providing, we're, we're giving out in two different ways. So the one way is really as data in different formats or on the other side with a visualization tool. So if you do not want to take care of how to render a map out of data and how to create buildings which are out of scale to their real world height or how to spawn particles which show rain and mist or the heat map which is showing the prime rays. This is something where you can just use our tools we provide in the Unreal Store or in Unity. So we have uh, plugins and packages for both of this. And here comes our customer products. So here is where a developer would build his or her own app on whatever device, because up till here, everything is backend magic. It's an API. So, and you can deploy this on any device you want. So this is something we don't really care about. So this is the business of our clients. Because I didn't show you anything, how this looks, a short video. So, and because this video is pretty old, I give you a tiny glimpse on elevation data. We also have inside the product and which can be seen in this tiny video here so that we can have hills and mountains and we have this to a very granular degree so that we even are working on projects where it is really important on how soil looks and how, um, uh, in, in, in what kind, uh, what kind of yeah, soil data we're having and slope and, and all these kinds of stuff. So use cases. So why would you use something like that? Why would you use something like Koala? I think everyone here who's attending this conference has use cases uh, for, for it data they would like to see in their product nevertheless. So we have one thing. So usually our clients work with uh, either want to do a real world augmented reality game. This is, this is something which is actually since Pokemon Go pretty big and pretty important, even if these successes which were made there were not really repeated so far. Um, another use case is apart from doing a product which needs a map and which needs different sources of real world data, Koala can be used to refine analytics. So maybe it is really important for your product that you know in what kind of context your user was while doing this or that. And another part 
where Koala comes in is if you really try to recreate a digital representation of the world, be it for it. Uh, for um, a product like a game or maybe even to run simulations. I brought you, so there are a lot of projects I could talk about, but I'm not really allowed to do this because these are uh, products of our clients. But I can show you one game which was created on, on Koala, um, which was even an example project by us. And here we go. Farmstead is a mobile, free-to-play, very social, augmented reality farming game. Create your unique and quirky avatar through the avatar generator. Find seeds for crops while walking in the real world, based on real-world weather, time and moon phases. Plant the seeds you found on your farm and collect their produce. Farms that have over 90 different crops and animals. Plant more and more seeds, place animals and buildings to create a beautiful farm. Grow your crops and feed your animals to produce items. Craft them into higher level goods in different buildings, like the mill and the kitchen. Fulfill tons of quests. And get lots of loot. Sell your crops and crafts to supermarkets or trade them with restaurants in the real world. Rent a horse if you do not want to walk. Take care of cute animals, like a dog. Your farm is influenced by real world time, weather, moon phases, and much more. Meet your friends and visit their farms. Play with friends and create the most beautiful community garden in your public park nearby. Scan real flowers to attract bees. So, yeah, other use cases. So there are a lot of application areas. Um, inside the tourism industry when it comes to balanced tourism and guided tourism, according to a bit more information than just sending people to the cool, cool sites and taking care of not sending people into crowded areas. Uh, I talked a bit about, about analytics. So how important it is for certain products to really know in what kind of context people are. Uh, there are even very, very interesting findings when it comes to monetization of, for example, mobile games or uh, other monetization strategies, that there is a direct correlation between spending behavior and weather patterns, uh, which is pretty exciting. So uh, also imagine if you are, are an advertiser. So because so if you are an advertiser, it might make sense for you to target people not only because of their behavior uh, while browsing the net, but maybe also because someone is standing in front of a Burger King and the advertiser really needs to sell the McDonald's ads. So it might make sense to spam the person there when he's developing hunger and then sending him to another store, maybe 300 meters further down the road. 
Uh, market research is also a pretty big um, area where it's more and more important to really figure out that the researchers really research the stuff they should have. So if they are in a study to visit a store, you can either track if they really visited the store and answered the question about it afterwards, or is maybe the survey you're doing affected by other things that you would never have imagined. So maybe your store rating goes down, not because your store is bad, but because you did the survey at a time where you had a construction site right outside of your door. And this is something you would normally not really figure out. Uh, yeah, we have application areas in, in eHealth. Uh, we have customers uh, developing an AR social network uh, or considering that. Uh, you could even use that with the custom POI system uh, to maybe create something for street artists where it comes to the point that you create your street art, which is naturally going away, but you can take a picture, put it in AR, um, and have a big network of art, which is not going away after, after a certain amount of time because it stays in AR. So one other short video. So, and now we're coming to the interesting part. So with all the projects we did in the past and we started doing what we're doing, so we started uh, the company with the sense, okay, how awesome would it be if a real world context could influence a digital product in 2013? And there are some things I really need or I really want to get across because there are some, they, they sound like no brainers, but they are so super important. So, first of all, when you're considering to do a product, be it a game or be it another product, please consider that you are sending people, and you're using geolocation in it, please consider that you are sending people to certain locations. And one thing design-wise, lots of our clients come up with is, hey, how awesome would it be if I use the GPS coordinate? of a user. I draw a circle around that user and spawn something within the circle just to keep that person going. So to always have something nearby, a short-term goal to achieve, a short-term reward to collect. And this is from a design perspective a very good thing to do, but from a geolocation perspective a very bad thing to do. Because this random cycle, there are lots of areas in it where you never want the person to go because your epic item you want to give to your player will naturally spawn at an autobahn. It will spawn on railways. It will spawn in the yard of a private person uh, who doesn't really like that you're walking in his garden. It will spawn in hospitals. It will, it will be at locations where you do not want random people to go to. Um, the moment Pokemon Go came alive, uh, it also had a death tracker. So there is a website which is called Pokemon Death Tracker. They only have 21 deaf people uh, trying the game or playing the game and not paying attention to their surroundings. But they have also 60 injuries uh, with the people losing their leg um, just because they wandered over a cliff because, hey, there was the Pokemon and I wanted to, to go over it. This was, of course, fixed, so this is so, but please make sure that you never use randomness, that you always anchor interesting sites, places where you need people to go to, to actual locations in the real world where people are allowed to go. So something like public 
post boxes are super places to send people to because people are supposed to go there. This is also the reason why Pokestops are usually monuments because people are supposed to go to monuments and look at them. So please have in mind, if you're dealing with the real world, you have lots of things you will never ever think about, like the military area at some remote place. Have in mind, don't send people to locations you cannot control. The second thing, lesson two. So doing something with real world is pretty fascinating. It's super cool. So sticking to my example with the champion of the undead in a game, which is spawning only at cemeteries during full moon, during a thunderstorm. This is an epic experience if you have something so complex influencing your product. But please be aware, no one knows that because it's so new. No one knows that these kind of cool contexts might be inside of my app. So start telling people about it with push notifications or whatever other mean you have, but tell people about it. So if I'm using, using the information that, that a, a player or a customer is at a location where he or she cannot really pay attention and I change my feature set inside the app because of that, which is pretty smart when it comes to onboarding processes. And I really want to get you onboarded fast and just skip all the really hard stuff, which is hard to understand. Tell them and give them an option. Tell them, hey, you are, you are at an airport. Maybe you want the easier version for now. And you can give out the, the strong and hard explanations at a moment which are better suited for your customer to really, really appreciate what you did and really understand what's going on. Lesson three, people are lazy. I think that this is something we all know. So you might also wonder, yeah, but there was a big craze about Pokemon Go and people really started walking. Yes, that is true, but it's true because that product gave people additional value. So the additional value is deep rooted into the Pokemon Go franchise. So you've got to catch them all. That was always the reason why you played the game. And this is why people start walking because you have to, you've got to catch them all. So, but deep down, we are super lazy. And if you don't give me this extra value, then I will not move. The part, so, so there is one big exemption if you're doing a sports app or a sports product, this is completely different. This is tightly linked. So because people are lazy, you have to give them this extra value if they want to, if you want to make them move and explore the real world or explore certain contexts. But one thing you should always refrain from is do not limit progress of the user due to the fact that you want the user to walk to a certain place. Again, sports apps different. But it is very, very important. If a user wants to engage with your product, the user wants to engage with the product on the user's terms. So if I want to do it now, I want to do it now and I don't want to be sent outside or to a certain place or to a certain something if I don't want to. But if you give be the option so but I nevertheless want to engage with the product now so this is also reason why lots uh, why in the gaming market for example lots of games changed to giving players options of not walking at all and using the whole game world maybe with a paid feature or with with a horse or with with whatever but they refrain more and more and more from limiting the progress the cool thing is if you don't limit progress but if you start giving out additional perks for people really exploring the world and using all the geolocation features, the weather features, the whatever features, then you are the product they will turn on if you are, if, if they are outside, instead of sticking with whatever they usually do when at home on the couch. Lesson five, we learned with all the products, choose your USP wisely and be aware what a USB is. Because that a product has real world data, 
is not a USP. It's a tool to make something really, really cool happen. So only by having, having a product which is based on the real world and lets you collect things in different skins are not USBs. Lesson six, we have 10 lessons. So lesson six is, please ensure player involvement prior to asking them for their GPS permission. So every time you wanna do a real world product and it has to draw real world data um, in, so real world data which needs, needs to be pinpointed to the GPS location and it's showing your surroundings and it's updating, so you need GPS. But users are getting more and more averse to all the permissions they have to give. And the only permission which is so obviously tracking my every movement, and there people get really picky, is the GPS permission. So this, this is a hard permission uh, to get. So if you don't want to have a churn at that point when you ask for the GPS permission, please make very, very clear why you need it and why your product doesn't work without it and why this is so super important and helpful for the user because a problem of the user is solved, a value is added. Make this clear before you ask your user. Yeah, otherwise you will turn. Lesson seven, contexts can really improve KPIs. So there was this wonderful moment with Pokemon Go in the very first version, weather wasn't even an issue. And after a while, they made one update where they integrated weather and made the spawn rate of certain Pokemons react on the weather type. So when it started to rain, you were able to find more water features. And this really did a jump in retention. So more people were coming back. And for example, another studio called Mixi, they had a very, very successful game. It's still a very successful game called Monster Strike. And it was a game which was performing very well for a very long amount of time. And when you are having a game which is running for a very long amount of time, then you need to come up with something new to keep people on board and get new people on board. And they included, they didn't do a real world AR game, but they had one, they, they put in one feature where at certain locations in the real world, and it was only in Japan, you could collect items in the real world when you were at a certain corner and stuff. And they saw a 30% increase in daily sessions after adding this feature. They also said that 50% of users who engaged with these features played the title for five or more consecutive days. And I mean, if you think about it, if you, you are playing a game or using a product and you figured out after a short while, hey, every time it's raining outside, it's also raining inside of my app and I get a bug, then you start playing that when it's raining because you see the world, you see it's raining and you know, hey, inside of my app, it will be raining as well. Come on, I turn it on. Or if you know that certain landmarks give you a certain perk, then you see a landmark and then you definitely have to try and figure out, hey, do I get the perk here as well? And so you open your app. And so your retention and your session count goes up, which is something you definitely want to have. So this, this looks weird. We thought about including our backend structure, just a node form, but it would have been too huge. So lesson eight is, it looks like a no brainer, but it is not. So when talking about, every time I talk about, hey, we can combine weather and geolocation and this and that, then people say, yeah, so what? Because no one is aware how hard it actually is to pull in all these different data sources. And just to give you a, a, a short, maybe a short feeding for that, we're talking about, I said this, petabytes of data. 
and so someone has to shift through this and, and filter out everything you really need. Then you need more than one data source. Apart from if you only strictly stick to geolocation, then you need only one. This is complicated enough. But the moment you need more than one, you have two different APIs. You have two different nomenclatures. You have two different languages. Maybe you have different database formats. You have different kinds of services. You have different billing systems. You have different request accounts for the billing system, and so on and so forth. Then it goes even deeper. If you want to include something like crime, there is no international database for crime. There is none. If you want to include soil data, there is no international database for soil. This is all on a national level. Maybe this is only there on a regional level. Crime, for example, there is an excellent database for crime in the UK. In Germany, every single state has its own database for crime, and they are all built up differently. And this goes on with every country. They are on a very, very, very different level, all these different kinds of databases. And you have to stitch them all together and find rules what overrules what. Ingress, the title before Pokemon Go, took, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but it was something over seven years to develop. And Pokemon, which used Ingress as a base and stripped out features, so they threw away features for Pokemon Go. It took additional three years to develop. Lesson nine, you do not need to go full out. So in order to use real world data, you don't have to, to plan a real world augmented reality game or a full place game with maps and all this kind attached. Uh, to have the benefits of the full KPIs. So the KPI boost can come from much smaller things. So like the example with Monster Strike, I meant they didn't do a fully fledged real world game. They only put in one feature. And there's also this wonderful push notification example where you can really drive retention or maybe get more consumers into your store. Because you know, every every Wednesday when it's bad weather, I don't have people in my store and I really want them to be there. So create the context. Rainy Wednesday, maybe near Starbucks, and you send out the push notification, come on in and grab your free cup of coffee or your coffee for 50% off or whatever it is. So you do not you do not need to use things super big to include real world data and have a benefit. Lesson 10 and this one I really like. Please remember the 2080 rule of innovation. So when it comes to using real world data in a digital product, this is in itself pretty often pretty innovative. So we have this wonderful, this wonderful thing right at the beginning when we started developing that we had a big problem of communicating what means what? Because we didn't want to do, so we wanted to do something so new and we didn't want to have the look of a Google map, so we wanted to do something else. So the first layer we did was an area layer, so we filled the world with content. And you see this on the left-hand side. And what you're actually seeing is, this is a railway or a big autobahn which goes to a part of the city. Uh, the orange ones are buildings. and no one understood what they were seeing. No one could orient itself, apart from our designers. And we sent our designer, so one of our junior designers, we sent on the challenge to find water because they, he was supposed to find water creatures. And he looked on the screen very hard and he, he saw, okay, yeah, there's a blue patch over there. This is water, cool, I need to go there. I need to go there, I need to go there. And then he fell into the river. And he fell into the river because he couldn't make the jump from the super stylized way we showed data to this is actually the real world he was walking in. So we moved on what you see here to a more Google Maps stylized way of doing things. And this doesn't, doesn't create problems of people understanding and orientating themselves and adding some, some trees and some highlights and stuff. And which is currently evolving, evolving into a very immersive world where we need a more immersive world, but based on the real world data you see here on the right hand side. Another thing is 
which is also really, really nice when working with real world data is that you can get people from the digital into the real world and from the real world back into the digital. So by the time my, my junior designer fell into the river because he, he, he knew, okay, yes, this is a water source on the digital map, but he didn't make the connection that this is an actual river in the real world he fell into. I had the exact opposite at that time because directly in front of my office or our office, we had a water patch. And I really didn't understand why we had a water patch shown on our Koala map right in front of the office because there is no water there, no water at all. And I came into the office and just like, people, we have a bug, we need to fix this. And they tried to fix the bug, but they couldn't find one. And the next day, when they said, okay, Christina, try again, I figured out that I was the bug because I didn't see that I was directly standing in front of an ancient water pump, which is actually there to pump water. And we knew this from the data, and that is why we made the, the water patch there. At that time, we didn't render, render buildings on top, this changed. But it was so fascinating for me to see what, what it does to you if you're if the digital is giving you little riddles and to start seeing your complete environment with new eyes because you can include it. So this brings me to the point that how many minutes do I have left? This brings me to the point that I would like to briefly show you how this is done. I'm not walking you through the whole system, but I'm walking you through a way of how to deal with big data. So what you see here is Koala. You can access Koala via koala.world. So if I log into, into our account, oh, and my account expired because I kept the page open for too long. Okay, I'm logging in into my account and I'm not walking you through configurations and stuff. So it has user management, blah, blah, blah. But I'm, I'm jumping right into the project site links. And what you see here, this is where the magic is happening. So we have context here and points of interest we can define. And when we're defining these kinds of contexts, one thing we wanted to do is, in this project, divide the world between six different clans. And we had a green clan here where you should have been able to find a green creature every time you are either at a park, see it's here, or in a forest, or in a dog park, or any place with animals which would have been zoos, wildlife parks, and veterinarians. Because for that game, it would have been too cool that you're sitting at a vet with your sick cat and just grind some creatures while waiting. But this was one of the simpler, simpler things we wanted to achieve. So I'm going to show you how easy it is to create something like the Champion of the Undead, which is actually going from tons of different databases. So what you're doing here is you define your end result, and the end result, in this case, is the champion of the undead. So, and what I'm doing is, in the first, I want, I want something Koala has. So, I'm creating this Koala node saying, hey, I want a location. And the location should be a cemetery. And if I pick this, I pick every cemetery in the world. Then I say, hey, I need another Koala tag. And it should be a moon face. And if I type in moon, I'm getting all the moon faces there are. I'm saying full moon because I want that. And as I said, the champion of the undead always spawns when you are on a cemetery during full moon, during a thunderstorm. I also need a weather tech. And I say thunderstorm. Then I pick another node because I want to combine it. I want that these three things must happen at the same time. So I'm picking N. And I combine this here. And this is how I created the context. And now if you're including Koala into your project via an API, 
then it was exact this information. So every time your, your client pings for ALA, it tells you, yes, Champion of the Undead is, is viable or it is not, so it's true or it's false, and, and what applies to the area your, your customer is at. If I want to say, hey, this is super, super creepy, and this would not be okay in tons of different countries, I could say, I could limit it to certain countries. And I could say Brazil is okay. So I want it either in Brazil or Germans are not so picky in this regard. So this is a cool event for Germany. And here I would say or, because if, if you are either in Brazil or in Germany and your user is hitting all these preconditions, then and only then in no other country should this happen and i could also extend this with the date or with tons of other things you can create like 50 nodes for one context then you can save this context and create use this context as base for something else and here comes in that that you can do this with all the different data sources we're having same goes for points of interest you, so you can do the same thing you can pick a point in the world, so either a certain longitude latitude, or you can say, hey, I want to apply this to every restaurant, or every restaurant when it's raining, or only certain ones. This is happening here with geofencing. Geofencing is the context sensitive push notification, which can be set over here. This is the Starbucks example where we said, okay, at rainy Wednesdays, this is a context you would have created with context. And you can specify that you send out a push notification the moment you enter this context or you leave this context. And then put a message here you would really like to send to your customer. Custom data lets you integrate your data points or user data points. Here you can allow users uh, to enter, so to, to, to send from your client points they set. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to make other users visible and use this feature, then you can do this over here. There are tons of other features attached, but I think I'm running out of time. So I would like to thank you all for spending time with me today about Koala and what you do with real world data in your product. And if you would like to reach out, please feel free to contact us to screenshot this so you have our contact details. Thank you very much. We, we do have about 10 minutes available or, or even more since we've got the break. Uh, if people have specific questions that they'd like to drop into the chat or the q and I'd be happy to uh, moderate those. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Christina, for uh, getting for presenting this. It was super interesting. Um, looking, particularly having spent some time working with um, the Pokemon Go products and and Ingress, um, and seeing what they were doing with location data. And, um, actually, I'll I'll throw this out as a first question. Uh, they've announced. Uh, Niantic has announced uh, a platform that they're they're going to bring in some of their allow some of their location data to be used by other other systems. Is that something you'd see as a competitor or as a as a potential plug-in? Considering your plug-in net kind of uh, network that you have there. Yeah, this is this is a very good question. Uh, we have been we have been looking looking at that stuff for a long time and. Um, so the point is that the, the thing we're doing and we're delving in depth is really making, so not only dealing with geolocation data, but going deeper and deeper and bringing more and more and more data layers in there, which would not be very profitable for certain, certain kind of products, but which would be a total necessity for, for certain kinds of simulations and, uh, and whatnot. So, so our expertise, so, so, so far as I understand it, and so far as I know the platform, 
it is very strong when it comes to the visual side and when it comes to the augmentation. So I think we all have seen this super cool video where the Pokemon is just jumping left and right so to avoid pedestrians walking to it. And this is something where there is a very, very big focus. And I think our, our addition and, and the extra value we bring to the table is the, the amount of data layers we bring in and the ease and the, the, it's the wrong word, the easiness you would say in German. So it's very, very simple to work with data with Koala. And this is something where we are very unique. And to follow up on that, uh, and you, you made a point earlier about the lack of unified data sources. Um, and certainly this is something that uh, any of us who have worked with location data of any, site, of any type have, have encountered over the, over the years. Um, is, there, is there a movement that you've seen to improve that? Um, on either a national or international scale to try to pull, pull data, to integrate more data, to create better data standards. And um, I know that I wind up going to the UNDP, the UN Development Program, because they have data for, for global things that nobody else has, certainly. Um, but even then, there's huge gaps right when you're especially when you're looking at longitudinal data you know you might have information from 1963 for a country and then not, no data for until 20 years later and then no data until 15 years later um but uh, what are you seeing around that around that aspect because that's going to have an enormous impact on ar um, broadly yeah i think that we're still trailing tremendously behind when it comes to set standards and unifying things. So we see, so there are slowly, slowly coming more and more projects to life where they say, okay, we are we're starting to gather uh, more tiny data sources and, um, uh, and putting them together or making them even open. So like open data sources when it comes to government stuff, but it's super crazy. So, I mean, when you're, to, to put it short, we are horribly behind. So it's, it's really time that we set standard and, and that, that, that it's, it's getting more on a globalized level. It still is super pain. And uh, this is also why we are doing this. There have been products we wanted to build by ourselves, but it was always the overarching strategy of Someone needs to do the work and start unifying stuff. So why not? Why not us? Fantastic. I uh, did get a couple of other questions for you. Uh, Daniel Stern Sternclar asked, "Do you provide any sample projects in Unity or Unreal?" Yes. Um, on your. For your yes. Project? Yes. So we have. Um, so basically, the two. Uh, so we have a big example project on Unity and a, a plugin with, with example maps in Unreal. And these provide, basically they already provide everything you would need to do for, you need for a Pokemon go -ish game or a digital representation. So it's map, it includes how to render, how many areas it makes sense to render in advance to not strain the system too much and also not to there are do's and don'ts in it so that you don't kill the data rate of, of the user. It already has the GPS um, uh, GPS mapping uh, inside it, the weather conditions, auto scale buildings, and, and all this stuff. Yes, you can find Koala on the on the UE4 marketplace, and it's not yet in the asset story, but we provide a complete Git repository with everything you need for the Unity project. You just go to uh, koala.world and, and you will find all the other links. Fantastic. Um, and then Shana um, asked, have you experimented with data alerts based on location? I'm thinking about flash floods, tornadoes, and similar disaster and emergency yeah. scenarios, which I'll just comment that I've gotten two during your talk. Um, oh my god. 
because we had a, a two flash flood alerts in, in my area while you were speaking. So fortunately, I had myself on mute so that not everybody heard the uh, yeah. coming through. We actually had the, had a special day here in Germany, which was announced one year ago, where we uh, tested all the warning systems we have in Germany for, for these kinds of things. Uh, you, yeah, very valid question. This is this is a very big topic on our roadmap, so this is something we really would like to get in um, uh, pretty soon, actually. Fantastic. Uh, 